The Dave Hooker Show. A presentation of Off the Hook Sports. Objective insight, expertise, top guest. Available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the Off the Hook Sports app. Download now for free. Also available on offthehooksports.com. I compute and obey. Now, today, Hooker. Ready. Load it up. What a show. Which college football coach will have his breakout season in 2023? I guess it was Josh Heupel last season. Some might argue Sonny Dykes. They did all right at TCU. Also, how the balls have fared against quarterbacks coming off a, uh, new quarterbacks, excuse me, coming off a 10 win season. June, a monstrous recruiting month for Tennessee and might well shape Josh Heupel's future. I'm going to tell you why. Also, I'll give you a breakdown of Tennessee's visitors that were on campus over the weekend for the 865 live event. And then we have some kickoff times, which is nice coming out of SEC spring meetings. Also hearing that the eight or nine permanent opponent or the eight or nine conference schedule is very much still up in the air. I kind of think that's gone backwards from what I'm hearing. So we'll dive into that tomorrow. They wanted to get it done by this week. I'm hearing them. There might be a temporary situation, which sounds just incredibly NCAA ish instead of SEC ish. But let me go to Caleb. Caleb, how are you, sir? I'm good. Happy June 1st, Dave. Yes, absolutely. Happy June 1st to you. And uh, it is a big month for Josh Heupel. And I want to get to that. By the way, Jermaine Copeland in the Celebrate 98 series will be up later today. And I thought that his son, uh, Jermaine Copeland, a wide receiver for the 98 National Championship team, was really, really good when Peyton Manning was there in 97. But turned into more of a blocking wide receiver, which is what they needed because that was a running football team in 98 to win a championship and just loved his check the ego at the door. He didn't care. He caught all kinds of balls in 97 from Peyton Manning. And then the offense gets dialed down with T Martin. He didn't care. So he changed his approach. I'm teasing it. It'll be on YouTube, but this is pretty cool. I'm just going to share this. So an intimidation block back in the day was the Player had to be on their back, okay? Nowadays, they're a little looser with that because football is not as physical. An intimidation block might be knocking a guy back three or four yards. Everybody's different. It's like scorekeeping in Major League Baseball. But this is back in the day when you put a guy on their back. How many times as a receiver, as a receiver, do you think Jermaine Copeland got credited for an intimidation block against Florida in 1998. Guess. Four? Which would be good. Yeah, Higher. That would be very. Wow. Seven? Two Higher, which would be great. What? 11? <laughs> which would be good for half a season. Higher. 15? Higher. Oh, my it's gosh. Not- 22? 22? It's 17. Oh 17 my gosh. intimidation blocks. That is unbelievable. I mean, if I'm a receiver, I'm proud of that for the entire season. I'm good with that. But he did it in one game against Florida. We got TV times, kids. What the H? What the? What was he thinking? Release the hounds. The Dave Hooker Show. Keep cool. A presentation of OffTheHookSports.com. So what the H brought to you today by Andy Mason, AndyMasonRealEstate.com. Andy Mason has the best prices and the best service in the biz. He'll take care of you. I'm about to call him as I'm about to make a move. AndyMasonRealEstate.com. Calm. Florida's a seven o'clock game. What the H? I mean, I want that to be a 3 30 peach of a game. And Tennessee's holding up its end of the deal, but Florida is not. 
That tells me right then and there that ESPN doesn't think highly of Billy Napier. And don't be afraid to read too much into these TV times, okay? Because they want their prime game on at 3.30, right, Caleb? Oh, exactly. Correct. They do. And it's CBS, you know, because CBS is still carrying the prime games for one more year for Tennessee. Right. For the so, SEC. Excuse me. So CBS went with what game instead? Uh, uh, we hear from the SEC spring meetings. I mean, to me, Tennessee not being a 330 game is an absolute just shame. It should be a 330 game all the time. Now, I, I will say this. I think that... Uh, Tennessee at a seven o'clock game, you're not going to want to hear this, but I don't think that's the best situation for them. It's a football team who practices in the morning. It's a, it's Georgia, South Carolina at the three 30 game. You know, it's funny if not for that one South Carolina game, it's probably Tennessee, Florida, but nevertheless, I don't think this helps Tennessee. I don't think you like to be on the road in a hotel waiting for a kickoff time. I think that was evident at South Carolina. I think the opposite was evident when they played LSU at 11 Central. I don't think this 7 o'clock time is good for Tennessee. doesn't mean that it's going to affect the point spread or my judgment of the game. That's not good for Tennessee, and I would much prefer that be on the 330 game instead of Georgia-South Carolina. Thank you, D, for the message board. Yeah, uh, 7 o'clock kickoff times always benefit the home team. Always, always, always. Noon kickoff times always benefit the road team. And I, I know Fred White would disagree because he would bring up that 99 loss to Arkansas where it was that 11 a.m. I think more than anything, that was just I, – I think that neutralized him. Arkansas had was not going to be lollygagging in that game after what happened the year before. <laughs> and so that's a totally different story. Uh, usually, though, that's how it typically works. You're right. I mean, these these night games, that same day Alabama plays South Florida at 3.30, ABC is carrying that game, funny enough. And I'm thinking, y'all couldn't have gotten Tennessee, Florida for that one? And no, you're right. It kind of leads you to believe, is there a lack of faith in Billy Napier? Is that going to creep into Tennessee? Are they going to relax a little bit too much for this Florida game? They shouldn't. You should never relax for Florida if you're Tennessee, if you know anything about history in this series. But yeah, I, I think... A favored team on the road, the worst setting is to play a night game when you're a favored team on the road. Completely agree. I mean, you would rather that be noon and and that sort of thing, but specifically talking to Cooper, and he's on the YouTube channel now, you know, it, it, he just said it's you would rather get up and get things done. I mean, noon's perfect, and especially on the road, then you, you're able to come back and you're able to have a, a meal and – if you win, enjoy the festivities and that sort of thing. But a seven o'clock game is just a uh, just terrible for uh, for any road team. Um, but we do know this: um, the crowd will certainly be into it, whether it's three thirty or seven o'clock. That crowd is pretty raucous. Now, Florida can be taken out. I've seen that happen before, where they just disappear for two quarters at times. But they're they're going to be. They're going to be ready to play that game, and the fans will be ready because of the revenge factor as well. Yeah, and can we talk a little bit of history on this? Because for those who don't know, Tennessee, Florida made the SEC on CBS. Just for the that that what? game made it, and that's never going to be a thing again. We thought this would be the last year for it, but with it not happening in the SEC moving from CBS, I think there's something a little it, from '96. For, I, I wrote about this yesterday. It was in the CBS primetime game. It kicked off SEC on CBS from and from 98 to 2001. Those four years, the college football world stopped for that game. Yep. And it lived up to its billing, and it's sad that that's ever going to happen. But Tennessee, fan can take, Tennessee fans can take solace in the fact that the la even though Florida dominated towards the end, it's barely a rivalry now. The last time they played on CBS, Tennessee got the win last year. Good history there. <laughs> Jacob Warren says what? What's up, everybody? This is Jacob Warren asking you to like, subscribe, and share. Dave needs this. He does. So go ahead and do that right now. And we'll have Cooper Rain. He's giving you some uh, tips as well uh, coming up.
had an interesting recording session with him yesterday. Cooper is absolutely fantastic. Check it out on the YouTube page. Josiah Jordan James will return to the Vols. How big of a boost is this, Caleb, in your mind? The Triple J back at the UT. This is huge for Tennessee. They have, and I wrote this yesterday, the most loaded team in the SEC now basketball-wise. And they're constructed the way they've always needed to be constructed, which is to say their transfer, they got Chris Ledlam, Josiah Jordan James returning. Those are going to be stretch four guys that play in the post. So Rick Barnes is going to play small ball. That's the, that is a huge, huge deal for Tennessee because I've been screaming at him to do that. I've been saying your defensive specialists need to play at the four and you need to have sharpshooters at the two and the three. Your wing needs to be another sharpshooter with your two. They are loaded with those. The only real question for Tennessee at this point is who's going to back up Zakai Ziegler at point guard when he, when he comes back. Because you don't really want Santiago Vescovi moving over into that role. So they need to find somebody. But Josiah Jordan James back is, is incredible. And if he get, if, remember, guys, he battled injuries last year, but he's averaged over 10 points a game the last two years, despite being the defensive specialist. If he can have one healthy offseason. One healthy off, or one healthy season and a full off season, and up his three point shooting to maybe thirty five percent. I mean, I'm look. There's low key all American potential with this guy. Remember, he was once a five star coming out. No, I, I think it's monstrous. Now you, but you think that Rick Barnes will shift his thinking to be more small ball, or does he have to do it because that's his roster? That he, it's his roster, but he chose this roster. And for those who don't realize, Tennessee. They were they were already maxed out on scholarships, by the way. So Josiah Jordan James is coming back as a walk on. Nil money's having something to say about that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So yeah, I think he's shifting his thinking because right now you have Jonas Adu and Toby Walker, are really your only two experienced post players. Now you have Cade Phillips and I believe it's JP Estrella coming in, but that's not. I mean. You can't have a two deep rotation with those guys at the um, in the post. So you're going to have to go with Josiah Jordan James, who has played the four, and Chris Ledlam, who's very experienced. And I mean, this is something that I, again, I think Tennessee fans should be very, very excited about. I think Rick Barnes is going to be forced to play small ball with this roster, but I do think it's a change of philosophy because he put together this roster, he assembled it. What are your thoughts on? where Tennessee can get. What's the glass ceiling for Tennessee? They're the Blue Bloods of North Carolina, Duke, Kentucky. Um, I don't think they can ever get there, but what can they do if this program takes off um, and has more postseason success than Rick Barnes is used to? I mean, you could always see a national championship with Tennessee. See, I agree. I agree. I thought you were going to set the goals a little bit lower, but I totally agree because of the NIL money. And the, the NIL money is is there. We've seen it in football. I think we did see it with Josiah Jordan James coming back. Here's the other thing. You have the facilities in the Pratt Pavilion and Thompson Bowling Arena, so you don't have to ask donors to build that. You just say, hey, get us the next Victor Wampanyana. I mean, that is your goal, is to find that next guy, and he can make $10 million a year in Tennessee to win a national championship. Say they did it. It's kind of like jumping out of an airplane, skydiving. I did it. I'm done. I'm good. Or running a marathon. They could do that and turn that within three to four years. I am not exaggerating whatsoever for effect. Yeah, and also, unlike football, there aren't – there aren't structural disadvantages really to any college. Any college basketball program could break through. There, there, there's not. It's, it's not like because basketball get. You're right. Get one superstar recruit. You got. You could have a national championship run or run one system. The proof of that more than anybody. By the way, we always forget about it. Arkansas. I don't think of them as a basketball state, but Nolan Richardson won a national title there, and yep. because he ran 40 minutes of hell. And well, so there's a, Florida too. Florida yeah, as well. Florida. Florida won back-to-back -back national titles. So I think college basketball, it's funny, college basketball, a lot more than college football, the coach actually has, it's more dependent. The coach is even more important because football, there's so many structural things that make a program good that is almost immune to whatever the coach does many times. I've said that about LSU for years. But basketball, it's, 
if you take a job at any power five or even lesser tier school, any coach can win a national title at any of those schools. Uh, Gonzaga, by the way, did not have the resources that Tennessee has currently to be able to put together one of the best college basketball programs in the nation. And I hate the term mid-major. There's no mid-majors anymore. If you spend the cash, it should all be based on that. If you're spending $25 million a year on basketball, you're not a mid-major. And I would guess that's somewhere around what Gonzaga is spending. Tennessee used to, back in the day, spend $10 million a year, $10, $15 million a year, and they had a pretty good program. Take it to the next level. Go ahead and drop that cash out there. Here's the other thing to remember, too, Caleb, that I would encourage those collectives out there. Basketball players, by definition, are better marketing athletes than any other sport because you see their face. You don't see football players' faces. So I go ahead and tell you, if I'm a personal injury attorney, uh, I know they're doing this a lot in Louisiana with LSU. I'm, I've am i got my arm around Josiah Jordan. Well, I've got my arm around the next Victor Wampanana, and I'm saying I'm all ball, and it's on every billboard in Knoxville. That is how you go out and market these guys, and that's how you associate yourself with them. So then every time somebody watches a basketball game, they think of uh, uh, Bobby. Bobby, he's a great personal injury attorney. Or uh, Johnny Charleston's car lot. That's where I need to go. That is exactly what I would do. And I would make him the absolute, not to take anything away from Nico, but I would make him the biggest star in Knoxville in order to win a national championship because I think Tennessee's in great shape in football already. They could be in elite shape with one dude, Caleb, one dude. Oh, I'm with you. Yeah, throw everything. Well, I'm almost with you. Okay. Because I I tried this in in pros now. I think the market has actually – this. I would say this is relatively recent. I would say this is only 10 years ago this uh, this was true, but it, it is true now. Basketball players were, by definition, more marketable than football players, except for quarterbacks. Quarterbacks have surpassed basketball players in terms of marketability. And just let's go to the NBA. I believe Patrick Mahomes has the richest contract in any sport now. Now, M- or, I, I, NBA players are the richest players by far of any sport, and they deserve it. But Patrick, but quarterbacks are the richest players specifically. And let's be honest, they deserve it. Patrick Mahomes is more marketable than any NBA player right now. Okay, well, let, let me ask you this then. Would you rather, you're a business in Knoxville. Would you rather have, and I'm picking a guy out that was elite and won a championship and you just got one year out of him, okay? So I'm going to go with Carmelo Anthony. Forget about the issues that he may have had in the NBA. and all. I'm just going with what he did at Cuse, okay? So would you rather have Carmelo Anthony and he win a national title or whatever Nico does. I'm still taking Nico. Three Are years you? of me. First of all, you get a better. Yeah, you get three years of Nico. You get one with Melo. And also, you can win a national title buying a quarterback just like you can buying a basketball player. It happened once with Melo, with, where they got a. I don't say, I'm not saying Syracuse bought him, but a one and done that won a national title. It also happened in football with Cam Newton. Auburn's like, let me get Cam Newton for a year. And we got a national title coming out of this. And national titles in football always outweigh national titles in basketball. But you don't know that under my premise, you don't know that a Nico's chance at a national win. title in football a chance, outweighs a, outweighs okay, a you take a chance title. at a national title over a national title with uh, Victor Carmelo Anthony the third. Okay, Dave. Dave, over let's, Nico. Let's, 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 let's break this down for a minute. Okay. Come on. Come it's, on. Let's break this down with uh, I might be on the air with an insane guy. That's where this is going. Go ahead. Wait, wait. Okay. It's like when somebody says, not to offend you, but you're gaining a lot Bernard, of weight. You're Knoxville right now. You need to sell a car. Let's just take it to the greatest player in each sport. You can either market Bernard King or Peyton Manning. Who are you? Who are you marketing? At the time, Bernard King was a big deal. I'm told you're before my time. Are you comparing him to Peyton Manning though, at Tennessee? He was on the front page of Sports Illustrated, so they're at least in the same ballpark. Well, 
Manning was supposed to be on the front page. I think they changed it after Florida dropped 62 on Tennessee. I think he was still on the, the front page. <laughs> Come on, Dave. I got you in a quarter. You're really going to go down this rabbit hole to say that Bernard King was more marketable than Peyton Manning? Okay. How about this? Would you take Bernard King over Casey Clawson? Casey Clawson was on the verge but didn't win one. As a marketing voice of your company, both – have impeccable characters, I guess. I didn't cover Bernard, but, but you're, let's say that you're, you're see that's unfair because no, you're talking, it's not. But, yes, it is. It's an unfair standard because you're taking the greatest player in Tennessee basketball history, bar none, who had a should should have been Hall of Fame NBA career, would have been had he not gotten injured, versus a top five quarterback in Tennessee football history who didn't have an NFL career. And I mean, it's debatable where he, it, I mean, I would, I would say he's in the three to five range. I mean, he's not top two in Tennessee football history as a quarterback. And if you do players in general, he's not even, he may not even be top 10. So, okay. So let me ask you, let's make it real clear. If Carmelo Anthony shows up on campus and wins a national title for the Vols and we're that, that would, that would therefore designate him as the best Tennessee basketball player of all time. Right. Yes, yes. I mean, he he would be anyway. I mean, in his prime, he he's better now in Houston, Ernie and Bernie and all that stuff, I think. Okay, so issues in the NBA withstanding. All right, so I'll give you him, that guy. I'll give you Vol Carmelo winning a national championship one year, or I'll give you what Peyton Manning did winning one SEC title. And from Peyton, a marketing perspective. Peyton Manning every single time. Every single time. Not even a question, bro. Probably largely depends on what you're marketing as well. A jeweler would rather have the fall leading into the holiday season, whereas maybe an HVAC dealer like City Heating and Air Conditioning would love to be on in March when the temperatures get higher. So I but guess it depends. Practice in March. There's spring practice in March. Football <laughs> is the engine. Football is the engine in a car. Basketball are the tires. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know what basketball is. The turn signal? It's something like that. Okay. Basketball is the turn signal. A fo football is the engine. That's rough. That's rough. All right. So how has Tennessee done uh, with a new quarterback coming off a 10-win season? I'm interested to see where uh, Caleb Calhoun goes with that. And also, June, a monstrous recruiting weekend for uh, a month, I should say. And I'll give you where Tennessee stands on all the guys that were in over the weekend based off my sources. So stay tuned. We'll be back in two minutes. Lots of Cruton coming up and uh, projecting Tennessee news from SEC spring meetings. But big time recruiting info that you'll want to hear next. Stay tuned. Two minutes off the sports. Family has been creating jewelry since 1986. Each piece unique with a story all its own. I'm Rick Terry with Rick Terry Jewelry Designs. I'm a jeweler, and I want to be your jeweler. We're grateful that you chose us to be Knoxville's best jeweler. My family and staff look forward to serving you. So please come see us. Kingston Pike and Campbell Station Road in the heart of Farragut and downtown on Gay Street, right next to the Tennessee Theater. Hi, Mike Davis here with City Heating and Air, reminding you to always dare to compare. Our team provides quality local heating and air service, installation, and maintenance across East Tennessee. We use only the best equipment like American Standard Heating and Air Conditioning for your residential, new construction, or commercial needs. Honesty, dependability, and customer satisfaction have been the cornerstones of our business since 1961. City Heat and Air. There's your pair. With all that sun, sand, and salt water, the beach is a very relaxing place. Unless you wear contacts, ow! Open your eyes to the best the beach has to offer with LASIK Vision Correction from Campbell Cunningham Laser Center. Ah. Do you want to own the more that owns every job? Then get to Vasti Lawn and Garden in Cleveland and get you a Toro. I'm David Vasti, here to talk to you about Toro. With a Toro Zero Turn, you'll get more out of every minute and you'll reach the finish line faster. At Bassey's, we like to say, no matter if you're mowing three acres a week or 11 lawns a day, homeowners and business owners alike find confidence in equipment they can trust from top to bottom. Bassey Lawn and Garden, Highway 60 North in Cleveland. Man alive, it's worth the drive. These mountains hold and defend a spirit far better than moonshine. 
A drink that holds flavor that becomes necessity. A hard cider made and relished by folk who are as hearty as they are legend. A refreshment that can only be found in one place. With a taste that makes you say, give me three bottles of the good stuff. Tennessee Cider Company, where necessity can be found. Objective coverage. Hey, that's new. If we get caught, we're going to jail. The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of Off the Hook Sports. YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the free Off the Hook Sports app. I'm going to need to see some identification. Back to Dave Hooker. What do you think, Caleb Calhoun? You want to talk some crouton? Let's roll. There's a lot going on. I've done my homework, so I want to bring it right here to you. Talking Cruton today, brought to you by Craft Treats. It is June the 1st, depending on when you're watching. This is an incredibly important month for Josh Heupel. I could make a strong argument that he would rather win June than beat Alabama or beat Georgia. This upcoming season. Not saying I'd go that direction, but I could make the strong argument. Because you have a program right now that's dependent on two things. Well, a lot of things, but personnel wise, two things. One is some of Jeremy Pruitt's players, prospects that are going to move on. The other is the transfer portal. Is that sustainable? Honestly, I don't know. I don't think it is but I'm not sure. We are in a totally new age. It would be like me saying that quantum physics uh, doesn't exist. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, maybe it is sustainable. Maybe you get five or six key transfers every single year, but I think you'd rather do it the Alabama way where you bring guys up. I think you also, you know, Alabama's perfect. They needed a running back. They got Jameer Gibbs. They're bringing guys up through the program and they keep that culture. I have real concern after the guys that you know I've gotten to know, in particular Jacob and Cooper, but there are other leaders in this program. Milton would be one. Hooker would have been one as well. And I could go on and on and on. Trey Flowers is one. I, I've concerned for Tennessee and Tennessee fans what happens when these guys move on because they were brought up through the program. They seen the hard times and they wanted to take advantage of when things were better. But the next group might not have the same attitude. And you always have to wonder about team chemistry from year to year. I think it'll be great this year. But after that, I don't know. And you have this influx of transfers. June is a monstrous month. Caleb, you pointed it out yesterday. I wrote the column about it. It's on offthehooksports.com. You have got to win some Junes. And it starts right now. Because you have got to be ready now for the 2025 season. That's what you're thinking in recruiting. I don't think Tennessee got a major haul of elite contributors that are going to be ready this upcoming season. So, and I'm not just talking about the 2023 class. I'm talking 2022 as well. It's You got to up it. And Caleb, you can go in and you can recruit guys early and you can make them you can make project players and all that. And that sounds good. And that works at UCF. But you got to go toe to toe and tell Nick Saban or Kirby Smart, I'm here to battle you. And I don't have to win every battle, but in particular with the area around Atlanta, you win two or three this year, then it could lead to a pipeline or at least a trickle of prospects coming out of the Atlanta area. And that is when Tennessee will be air quotes back i agree with everything you said june this is the most important june of josh heupel's entire of josh heupel's tenure at tennessee it's the most important month maybe of his entire tenure at tennessee it will define the program because i'll go out and straight up say it it's not sustainable the relying on the transfer portal there are there have been reports that the market for nil is stabilizing i think i think it was the wild west a lot of a lot of businesses started throwing money but what they're going to learn really fast, and you know this, Dave, we just talked about last segment, throwing money at basketball players versus football. Football's a lot harder to project than basketball. So throwing money at these transfers or anything like that, it's really hard to know exactly if they're going to fit in. And they can't just keep doing that. 
So at some point, Josh Heifel's going to have to go the old school way of getting commitments, elite commitments. He has got Tennessee at a place right now, riding a wave of momentum after last year's 11 and two season to do that. Now here's how this all plays out. 2023 is still going to be reliant on transfer portal players and Jeremy Brewer recruits, give or take a few, a couple of spots. He needs to be successful in 2023 and he needs another transfer portal haul in the 2023 to 2024 season. But he needs a loaded 2024 recruiting class. So that way, by 2025, he's ready to go. Recruiting class a year. If it's an elite recruiting class, you give it a year before it really takes over the program. And so 2025 is will be the first year he's going to have to rely on his recruits. That means the 2024 class has got to be loaded, and the most important month in recruiting season now is June, bar none. Totally agree. So Tennessee right now has the Merklinger quarterback, Jake, out of Savannah, Georgia, which is great. I mean, you always want your next quarterback, but I think out of the Atlanta area would be very uh, significant. And then they've got Jeremiah Hurd, who's a three-star guy. No offense against Jeremiah. That's not the type of guys I'm the guy I'm talking about. Uh, you know, he's out of Rome, Georgia. I think you got to go out and, and, and I don't think Tennessee's ready at this point to do the major haul when they got um Cozy Coleman, Jamal Lewis, and Deion Grant, which would have been 90 70. It would have been 96. Um they got those four guys. Yeah, right. Okay, so but what you can hope for, I don't think you're ready to hope for that yet. But what you can hope for is the class before that. That just happened to be the number one class in the nation. But that had the Jeff Coleman's of the world, the guys that did provide that pipeline into other states, Fred White's of the world. That's what you're hoping for. And then next year's your gangbuster class. But listen, guys, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, Tennessee was 10th in recruiting, which sounds good. And Butch Jones would tell you that is – uh, he's a champion in life already giving the trophy, but that's sixth. When you include Texas and Oklahoma in the sec, that's sixth. that's behind Alabama, Georgia, LSU, Texas, and Oklahoma. That ain't getting it done. Tennessee will need to be pressing right up against that top five. And if you're saying Dave, 10 and five, that's not that big of a difference. I covered recruiting for 20 years. It is a huge difference. It's the difference between a couple more four stars or maybe one more five star. And if Tennessee isn't able to do that this year, this month, then I've got concerns moving forward because you're right. They have all the momentum. Nobody's harping on the South Carolina game. Now they're harping on the fact that Tennessee was number one, won 10 games. It was fantastic. Caleb, that's where Tennessee needs to be. They need to get that. I'm not saying the number one class in the nation. They need to get some of those cats where they go toe-to-toe, eye-to-eye with Kirby Smart, and they win those battles. They say, we can win, and then they don't have to evaluate guys early and hope they de- they continue to develop as prospects, which is what they've done to this point. Yes, and if they don't, if they don't do that this month, that is when we are going to look back on that South Carolina game. Because I can tell you right now, Tennessee, that South Carolina game calls Tennessee three recruits right now, who if they had those three recruits, it'd be a top-five class easily. Not even a question. And so that, that, that game was going to, if they don't have the momentum to do what they need to do in June, that South Carolina game will prove way more costly than just not making a college football playoff in 2022. I can tell you guys that right now. Another important point on this is that I think that talent evaluation, we aren't sure of with Josh Heifel, but I will give him credit with Jeremiah's her, cause you mentioned him. Her didn't play football till eight. He he played football in eighth grade, didn't play again until last year. That's why his rating was so low. And Heupel and Tennessee were the first to offer him before anybody. And no, and I'm I'm still down with those guys. Don't get me wrong. Okay. I'm I'm down with getting those guys, but at some point, you don't need the good backstory. You don't need the might develop into something special. I mean, do you there's do you a, there's think- a difference, but let's just put it this way. There's a difference between, I'm not singling anybody out, but the linemen they have taken recently, in particular the defensive linemen, and a Cade Mays. 
who walks in the door, a five-star prospect, six foot six, 335 pounds, and is probably ready to play from day one. We're talking about a whole different cat, right? So basically what you're saying is Tennessee needs to start getting the guys that any idiot off the street could tell could start from day one. If they, the, it, Somebody who's never watched football would know they could play football. It's the off the hook. It's our own rating system. It's anywhere, somewhere, and nowhere. They need the anywhere guys. Herd's, what about, a, some, Herd's a somewhere guy. Alabama or Georgia, would they take Herd? I don't know. Probably not. So, so my question then becomes, what about how much of recruiting can sometimes be just out – evaluating other coaches because we're giving hypo credit we're giving Pruitt credit for this assembled talent for hypo Pruitt never really he he had one fringe top 10 class at Tennessee but he just evaluated the talent so well is that sustainable long term or do you all or, or if is it one of those things where you're going to have to find you're going to have to win over the obvious guys I think you definitely should evaluate some guys at a higher level and have those guys in your class that you point to that said George Alabama didn't care about him, but we knew he would be great. Jamal Lewis was that guy, as we discovered during our Celebrate 98 series. That sounds crazy now, but Georgia wasn't high on Jamal Lewis. So Tennessee was. I know it sounds crazy in in retrospect, right? Yes, but also, again, that was Ray Goff. (laughs) I I, I agree, but Kirby Smart, everybody (laughs) makes mistakes. So you've got to take advantage of those mistakes. So I'm not discounting early recruiting. I'm not discounting being a better talent talent evaluator, but you've got to win a third of your battles on head-to-head four-star guys against Georgia, right? Right? Yeah, now, I, Travis, I says, Travis says, I disagree. We aren't a prototypical team. Okay, and, and I'm glad you brought that point up, Travis, because Tennessee has several advantages. They have, I think, a real offensive guru slash wizard as its head coach. That's huge. They have NIL, which is huge. But if you want to take the next step and be elite, I think they've got to beat Georgia from time to time and Alabama for some of the top guys. Yes, this isn't the 90s where Spurrier could just get a bunch of track stars in his backyard and be an offensive genius and out-scheme everybody. That doesn't happen in the SEC anymore. And so he's going to actually have to actively go out and get some talent. And again, also that was happening in the 90s when nobody else had – everybody ran – two cornerbacks and a slow safety. So it was easy to run his offense. So you, yes, Josh Heupel is an offensive wizard. I I fully agree on that, but you do have to get a certain level of talent to run that philosophy. Again, one, you need fast receivers. Now he's got a pretty good pipeline of receivers coming in and out, but you also have to have good interior blocking because Heupel's offense doesn't work. If the run game is not a legitimate threat, it just doesn't. This isn't Mike Leach in the air raid. No, I, I, I agree. And a question on the message board. I wasn't referring specifically to Cade Mays and his size, but I, I'm, you know, Darnell Wright, they got up to that size. They turned him into that sort of player. So it's not an issue of being too big or too small. Now, you certainly don't want the guy that I don't even remember his name that uh, Butch got another Butch reference, Lyle. That you don't want the guy that they got out of Florida. Do you remember him that was like 248 pounds, an offensive tackle? I mean, he was horrible. And a question, he wasn't going to play. And a question about Peyton Lewis. Um, you know, Peyton had interest from Alabama, Auburn, Boston College, Cincinnati. Yeah, you know, that might end up being a great get where Tennessee was ahead of the curve. But I think Alabama and Auburn were certainly interested. Is that a huge win? No, but it's a significant win. That's that's certainly a step in the right direction. I got no issue with that whatsoever. It's today's tough question. Where does Tennessee need to be in recruiting for June to be a great month? Today's tough question. Take a side. Take a stand. The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of offthehooksports.com. Okay, recruiting rankings are stupid, but that's all, it's what we got. And the simple fact is how successful an individual website is covering a program will affect their recruiting stature. You get an extra star if you go to this school because they've got a big site on a network. That's just the way things go. I'm not calling anybody out. You can decide for yourself. 
That's why I like the 247 composite. So when I look at that composite, I think it's the closest we've got to a thermometer of the temperature. And I'm going to say that Tennessee needs to be a top five school in recruiting to compete for championships each and every year. I do not think that's a reach whatsoever. Is that too strong, Caleb Callahan? Every year, I think that might be a little too strong. I don't even think they were top five class every year of the 90s. The 95 class that Fred White was part of wasn't even top 10, funny enough. Um, it's, I think, I think two top five classes, three top 10 classes, and four top 12 classes. But one can be out of the top 10 and one can be out of the top five. But you need a minimum of two top five. Well, I was specifically talking about this upcoming class. Oh, this class. This class has to be top five. This class needs to be top five. Yes, it's because they haven't had one yet. And as you've pointed out, with Tennessee and the politicking of recruiting rankings, when Tennessee has a top five class, it's probably about a top seven class or top eight class. So they, they had the number 10 class last year. That probably means they had the number 12 class, honestly. And the, yeah, Tennessee needs to have a top five class. I think the most important thing is every they need to make sure they're top 10 in every recruiting service. So people tout 247 composite last year for top 10. But they weren't top 10 on Rivals. Now, I don't know how people feel about Rivals with on three emerging now. I don't know if they're as credible as they used to be. You probably know more about that than I do. But unfortunately, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, 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 I've heard that they, yeah, I know on three seemed to poach a lot of the Rivals recruiting analysts when they came on board. So I don't know who's which, which side is in better shape between the two. But Tennessee wasn't top 10 on Rivals. And... I actually go composite, and then this might surprise you, but when it comes to the elite guys, not all 500 prospects, but the elite guys, I like ESPN's crew. But they just don't have the manpower to be able to judge 500 guys. So when they talk about their top 300, I, I do think they they hit that pretty much with a, a nail on the head. Now, let's take a look at, at Tennessee's – uh, 865 Live recruiting weekend that happened over this past weekend. And we know that Tennessee picked up Peyton Lewis as a commitment, but that was going to happen on Saturday. So what did Tennessee actually accomplish? Well, I think they would have loved to get a commitment from Boo Carter out of Brainerd. We've talked a lot about him, a four-star athlete prospect. Here's what I'm hearing, that he'll end up at Tennessee. But this whole Colorado thing with Deion Sanders certainly has his attention. So I'm not ruling that out at all. I think he could end up at Colorado, uh, but if I had to make a bet, I feel 60-40 Tennessee, and Colorado certainly in that 40%. Um, he's kind of, a, kind of a weird bird. He switched high schools. Um, he, he, he seems to flirt with Tennessee a lot, but does he love Tennessee? I don't know. Um, I guess he's going to end up telling us, but don't be surprised if that takes until the early signing period in December. Yeah, and this also is – missing out on Boo Carter is not as big of a gut punch, but when you combine it with missing out on Walter Nolan a couple of years ago, that that's going to be a big red flag for Josh Heupel if that happens. Now, I'm not going to put that on Josh Heupel too much. I got to say this. The NIL collective for Tennessee needs to get a little bit smarter about how they spend their money. I'm not saying that it's bad to throw $8 million at Niku Iamaleava, but I am saying – you don't spend all your money there and let Walter Nolan get out of Knoxville. Because quite honestly, I think he went to Texas A&M because Texas A&M had more NIL money. I have no problem saying that up front out, out loud right here, even though that's technically against the rules. And there, No, I think you, you're right. Yeah. And if you're Tennessee, you don't let Texas A&M outbid you for Walter Nolan. You can't let Colorado outbid you for Boo Carter. I don't know what Colorado's NIL initiative is right now. I know Deion Sanders selling the little selling the glam probably has some people probably has some advertisers wanting to get involved. So I'm intrigued by that. But you to the to the NIL collective, to Spire Sports, don't let these defensive stars get out of East Tennessee. Throw your yep. money at them. Josh Heifold needs them. Yep, I agree. Uh, this list is brought to you by Craft Treats. Go to crafttreats.com, use a promo code off the hook, off the hook, and you will get 20% off your purchase. Don't forget about the chill pills that has the CBD dog treats, will help with your pet's digestive issues, arthritis, uh, and also anxiety. It's pretty awesome, the chill pills, but they've got non CBD as well. Use a promo code off the hook. 
get 20% off. So the guy that everybody wants to hear about, and you're not going to have anything definitive on him anytime soon, is five-star linebacker Sammy Brown, 6'2", 230 pounds, out of Jefferson High School. I think Tennessee has a shot, but ultimately it would be hard for me not to pick Georgia. Feel free to jump in if you got any thoughts on these as I run through them. I, I, uh, I actually think I, I think Clemson's in the lead for Brown, so I think Tennessee should go all in, if anything, to make sure he doesn't end up at Clemson. For those who don't know, Clemson's a bigger threat. Clemson's success is a bigger threat to Tennessee than Georgia long-term. Georgia's going to be Georgia. They're that good. But if Clemson's good, that, that ices out another recruiting area for Tennessee. Great point. Wide receiver Freddie DeBose. Um, out of Smithson Valley in Spring Branch, Texas, coming off a torn ACL. This is one of those project guys. You know, you got an in on maybe an elite athlete because he had the ACL injury, still a four star prospect. Tight end Amir Jackson, four star tight end from Portal, Georgia High School, not the Portal. Uh, he has already said he would return for a visit to Tennessee. I think. Tennessee has a great shot at him. Uh, Florida and Miami are in it. Georgia, not so sure. Josh Petty, offensive tackle. Now, this is a 2025 prospect. Four-star offensive tackle out of Roswell, Georgia. This is the type of cat I'm, I'm talking about. Already interest from Auburn, and we know Hugh Freeze can recruit that area well. This is the type of cat I'm talking about. Because Georgia is going to come calling. He's a 2025. Tennessee's trying to get in early. This is the type of cat I'm talking about. So when Georgia comes down the line and they say, we're still Georgia, this is your home state, let's play ball, Tennessee can say, we're on you first, and we've got other four-star guys already in your class. Um, Caleb Calhoun's distant cousin, Daniel Calhoun, an offensive tackle from Marietta, Georgia, six foot six, 355 pounds, heavily pursued by Georgia, Texas, Alabama, and Auburn. This is the cat other than Sammy Brown that I'm talking about, that you got to get out of Georgia eventually. That's the type of cat. Aiden you're not Greeley. getting him. Sorry. No, you're, not. you're not getting, you're not no, getting you're Daniel not. Calhoun. No, you're also, not. Also, 355. You, no way. Do you, have, do you have an insight since he's your cousin? I do not have an insight. But looking at his size, if you were a 355-pound lineman, would you rather play in Georgia's offense or Tennessee's offense? You'd rather play in Georgia's offense. Right. That's the type of cat you want, whether it's this year, <laughs> next year, another dude, or this dude. Aiden Braylon is out of Santa Ana, California, six foot five, 290 pounds, four star defensive lineman. This is the guy where you flex your muscle because, hey, I'm Tennessee and I've got the recruiting budget to go out to California and pull cats. And Nico certainly helps you. And Defense Nico's from modern day, isn't he? Uh, he was from Polytech and then he went to Riverside. I thought Tennessee had somebody on their team from modern day. But uh, they had the um, way back, uh, the uh, late Polynesian defensive end. Oh, uh, uh, Jesse Mahalona. Oh, Brew McCoy. Brew McCoy went to modern day. Yeah, okay. Brew McCoy. That's right. There you go. Uh, defense him. now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, defensive lineman Amari Adams. Been to Tennessee several times. I think the Vols could very well end up with him, a four-star prospect, beginning we're talking about 2025. Cameron Fountain. And they got to get him out of South Carolina, and that South Carolina loss, that's where that weighs heavily on you. Agreed. Cameron Fountain of Youth, an edge rusher. He is six foot five, 237 pounds. I think there's a great relationship with defensive line coach Rodney Garner. That should help Tennessee. And I think they can get him athlete Cameron Michael. Man, it's another tough pull from Georgia. So he's from Statesboro, Georgia High School, and I think he's going to take his time. Again, it's the type of cat you got to beat Georgia for every once in a while. And would then you want to play defensive back for Georgia or Tennessee? I wouldn't want to play defense at all for Tennessee, to be real honest with you, <laughs> unless I'm an edge rusher. Man, I'm yeah, down exactly. with that because I'm going to pad my sack stats. And nothing's more important than sack stats. Defensive back DeMello Jones – Probably the longest shot of the group that was in town last weekend. A uh, four-star prospect has been committed to Georgia. So there you go. That's a complete breakdown of the visitors. Want to be sure and thank uh, Caleb Giroux, who's killing it on offthehooksports.com. He couldn't join us today, but he is uh, absolutely slaying it in recruiting. So, And we're free, advertiser base. So how about that? So, yeah, Tennessee had some cats in there that they want to land. 
that would be those sort of game changing type of prospects. And they bundled them with Peyton Lewis, who they knew was going to commit Merklinger. It was a very, a very, what I would call as far as a recruiting weekend. And I, again, I've done this for 20 years, so I can, I can tell from a mile away. It was very focused on the guys that I mentioned, the four star guys, because you have a good family feel and guys that are already committed. They can then recruit those players as prospects. That's what this was all about. This was this weekend was all about landing one or two of those guys that we just talked about that Tennessee has to have to turn the program into an annual championship contender. Yeah, no, I'm with you. That's exactly what this was about. And they need to be able to get a couple of them. It hurts them that the NCAA investigation still hasn't ended. By the way, I don't know if like I, I, I know totally forgot about that, right? And but I will say that I mean at this point, just for the sake of recruiting day with June here, isn't it worth the scholarship reductions that you might get? Just accept it, because I'd rather have the scholarship reductions and miss than ha- than get hampered in June recruiting. I don't know. That seems kind of rough. I'm not going to take it if I didn't do anything wrong. Two minutes. How does Tennessee typically do with a new quarterback coming off of? 10 win seasons, and we'll tell you who the breakout coach of this upcoming 2023 season will be. Is he, is he in the SEC? We'll discuss. Caleb Calhoun, I'm Dave Pope. And Craving Wings, South North Shore location, where we've heard people say that you can get the best wings in East Tennessee. Pero quien es este? El número 87, Jacob Warren. I'll just do six for my sauce, 87, please. Imposible, señorita. Dale seis más. Look at these wings, perfectas, deliciosas, fantásticas. Man, I don't know what you're saying, but it sounds awesome. How do you say fresh, never frozen in Spanish? Frescas, nunca congeladas. Make your way to Craven Wings and get you seis más. But what was funny about Kate is we were a full continuum of care at that time. We had detox, we had inpatient, we had outpatient. So we were doing a lot of the things that we do now. But now we just do them so much better. It's really a simple program, but it's, we're complicated people. I am what I am, and now i got to do something about it. You can take your life back. Call Cadis today. Got cataracts? We can fix that. Never miss another moment. With a little help from Drs. Campbell, Cunningham, Taylor, and Hahn at cctis.com. Do you want to own the more that owns every job? Then get the Vasti Lawn and Garden in Cleveland and get you a Toro. I'm David Vasti, here to talk to you about Toro. With a Toro Zero Turn, you'll get more out of every minute and you'll reach the finish line faster. At Vasti's, we like to say, no matter if you're mowing three acres a week or 11 lawns a day, homeowners and business owners alike find confidence in equipment they can trust from top to bottom. Vasti Lawn and Garden, Highway 60 North in Cleveland. Man alive, it's worth the drive. Our family has been creating jewelry since 1986, each piece unique with a story all its own. I'm Rick Terry with Rick Terry Jewelry Designs. I'm a jeweler and I wanna be your jeweler. We're grateful that you chose us to be Knoxville's best jeweler. My family and staff look forward to serving you. So please come see us. Kingston Pike and Campbell Station Road in the heart of Farragut and downtown on Gay Street, right next to the Tennessee Theater. Um, who's this guy? Hello, wizard! The Dave Hooker Show, Ooh. a presentation of Off the Hook Sports. What? YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the free Off the Hook Sports app. Back to Dave Hooker. Who was the breakout coach in 2022? The breakout coach in 2022 was, I think it was a tie between Josh Heupel and Sonny Dykes. You can go either one of those. Even though, even though Sonny Dykes had broken out in the past in Cal, you can re-break out. So you can break out again. and Double break out. Double like break breakout. into Electric Boogaloo. Who's seen that movie? Did you see that? No. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, fine. There are some times where the sequel is better than the original. And that was oh. break into Electric Boogaloo. Godfather 2 was better than the original um the second Empire star Strikes wars Back. yes well the thing everyone said and i'm a star wars nerd the only thing that people forget is i 
The Empire Strikes Back is considered better because the beginning is so strong with the Battle of Hoth and then the greatest twist in cinema history at the end. But yes. in between that, it's actually kind of a dull movie. Like, A New Hope is a much more fun adventure, the first Star Wars. I think this discussing this further would be a great way to chase off listeners and viewers. <laughs> <laughs> We'll do a totally separate Star Wars show. Jacob Horn, bring us back to Earth. What do people need to do? What do they need to do right now after that Star Wars breakdown? Jacob, tell me. What's up, everybody? This is Jacob Horn asking you to like, subscribe, and share. Dave needs this. <laughs> there we go. All right. So you posed this question at our 3.15 a.m. pre-production meeting it and was 17 was... on Tatooine. Sorry. <laughs> yes. It was a little later on Tatooine. All right. So, uh, and is it AT-ATs or ATs, ATs? What do you mean? The uh, big four footed things that walk around on Hoth. It's not, it's AT-ATs, right? My son calls them AT, ATs. Uh, are you talking about the, the Tauntauns? No, the things that walk. The, 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 the robot. Big, huge. Oh, the big yeah. ones that do the shooting. Oh, are they? They're at ats They're not AT-ATs. Oh, right. okay. Here we go. <laughs> Let's go with this. All right. So tell me, um, Caleb Calhoun, how Tennessee has fared coming off a 10-win season with a new quarterback. We are back on track, Travis. Sorry. So I'm going back in time. So for people who don't know history, Tennessee has had quite a few 10-win seasons over the years. But – you can only count changing in quarterbacks from the Doug Dickey era because I don't know those who don't know Tennessee history, Robert Neal and Belton Wyatt stuck with the single wing, the single wing. There was never really an actual quarterback. You didn't need like, there were three guys and it could be snapped to any one of them <laughs> during that time. Right. And so quarterback wasn't really a thing until Doug Dickey comes, introduces the slot T and Dewey Ward becomes a breakout superstar for Tennessee. So going back to that time, Tennessee has had, Five 10 win seasons in which they had to replace a quarterback the next year. The first was actually Bill Battle's first year, believe it or not. That would have been 1970. They went, for those who don't know, Tennessee actually went 11 and 1 that year, finished in number four, I believe, and won the Sugar Bowl, but did not win the SEC championship because they lost to Alabama. Quarterback that year was Bobby Scott. I'm sure you you know of him. He I did. Yep, followed Dewey Warren, won the SEC in 69. That was actually a very successful quarterback. The next Watched year... Watched sentences with, well, you knew. <laughs> <laughs> so, Who's going to win Saturday? Well, you know, I think it'll be Tennessee. Go ahead. So how'd they do the year after Bobby Scott left? Well, they went 10-2 and two and finished in the top 10. Pretty good. Well, that, good. Ye that year was 1971 when they did that. They had Condrich. That, that was another year where they had 10 wins, and then they had to replace their quarterback the next year, which was 72. In 71, Jim Maxwell was their quarterback. They were waiting for Conjure Holloway to start, who started in 1972. And how did they do after 71? They went 10 and 2 again in 1972. And then, as you, as for people who know the history, Bill Battle started the taper off and got fired to make room for Johnny Majors. But so let's, then we fast forward to 1997. Tennessee wins the SEC championship. They go 11 and 2. Then they have to replace Peyton Manning. Dave, how'd they do when they replaced Peyton Manning? I'm trying to remember. They okay, they won a national title. They did. They did. There, there were a couple of close games if you want to nitpick. By the way, check out the Celebrate 98 series on our YouTube channel. Go ahead. Another one. 2003, they went 10-3 and with Casey Clawson. They entered 2004 with CJ Leak, Brent Schaefer, Eric Gange, and Rick Clawson. And guess what? They overachieved. They won the East that year. And went ten and three again. And that that, that, that summer, still, that, that was still the period of Philip Fulmer can do no wrong. It was. It was. And then it came and crashing it, down the next year. All right, <laughs> crashing. <laughs> and then the so so far, what I'm showing you is Tennessee does pretty good when they have to replace a quarterback from a ten win season. But then there's just one more. You know, in 2007, they won the yeah. SEC East and went ten and four. And then 2008 happened. Yeah, and they fired their most legendary coach, to, one of the two most legendary coaches, 
definitely the most legendary coach in the modern era. So that went south quick. I don't think that's going to happen to Josh Heupel with Joe Milton this year. No, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think you're going to have a – God, what was that Auburn game that year? That might have been the worst game I ever watched, that 14-12 to 12 game. I don't think you're going <laughs> to yeah. remember that. <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't think that's going to happen. But, right, yes. So, so Caleb's stoking the optimism once again. He's already picked a national title for 2024. Now he's saying that Tennessee, what, is a close – uh, second place in the college football championship game. Is that what you were saying this year? Well, no, because they don't have Derek Dooley coaching them. So he would get that's, <laughs> that's the key. City Heating and Air Conditioning, cityheatandair.com. Integrity matters. Over 50 years of experience in East Tennessee, the temperatures are going to rise. And you need to make sure that you've got somebody that can say, hey, you just need a new part or coolant. You don't need an entirely... Uh, new unit altogether. Well, that's where integrity, integrity matters. City heating and air, city heat and air dot com. Okay, so then if if we've got a breakout coach last year was Sonny Dykes uh, or Josh, Josh Heifel. Heifel. It's as simple as that, right? I don't think there's anybody really even in the argument there. So as far as breakout coach, this season in 2023 first set the parameters and then I'm going to give you my thoughts. What are the parameters on being a breakout coach? Basically it's, it's very fluid and it, it can be, it can change from situ because every situation is unique, but you have to take, you have to have taken a huge leap forward from the previous year to the point to where you are talked about nationally and maybe even floated as a coach of the year candidate for what you did. Fair. And you haven't done it before to that level. You, you haven't done it before at the school you're at. You can't oh. have done it before, but just not at the school you're at. So, and, and also not be, well, I don't know. See, this is because Sonny Dykes, it's not like Sonny Dykes hadn't done this before. He, well, he hadn't gone, he hadn't done this well. I take that back. So, yeah, I'll say you, or like Josh Heupel. Josh Heupel had gone undefeated at UCF, but then he went 11 into it. How about this? You cannot have done it at, at the Power Five level. Okay, let me give you this one too. Like Brian Kelly, for instance, to be a breakout coach this year, he would have to win the national title and go undefeated. Yes. I mean, I think yes. we think right now that he's going to be a playoff contender even this year, but. He would have to take a major step up. So here we go. It's four downs. I'm going to throw some names at you. You tell me if they will be your breakout coach. But first, you you say Tony Elliott. Why Tony Elliott is your breakout coach? So Tony Elliott is, I think, one of the most underrated hires. I want. I thought Tennessee actually, before I knew they were going to hire Josh Heupel, and I was wrong. But I thought Tony Elliott was a great guy for them to hire. For those who don't know, Clemson's offense didn't really take that next step to become a national title contender until Dabo Swinney promoted Tony Elliott. And Tennessee plays him the first game of the year. I don't – look, I, they're not – Virginia's not going to beat Tennessee. Tennessee is going to blow them out. And, but they've got James Madison, William & Mary, a rebuilding NC State, Georgia Tech – a very bad Virginia Tech. Virginia has the higher has the upper hand in that rivalry right now with Brent Pry. Boston College. I mean, I've seen eight wins possibly on the schedule right now. And wow, Caleb bringing us back down to earth as Tennessee's going to face the greatest coach in the history of college football in the opener. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I didn't goodness. say that. Four downs now. Brought to you by Campbell Cunningham, Taylor, and on. Four downs. Four questions. Four answers. The Dave Hooker Show. Four. Four. Four downs. A presentation of offthehooksports.com. All right. I'm going to throw some names at you. And Caleb, you can tell me yay, nay, or doesn't qualify. How about that? Okay, so okay. these would be these would be breakout coaches this season. So Let's get it rolling right now. First down, Billy Napier. Can he be a breakout coach in 2023? He can, but he won't be. Okay, so you're saying out of yay, nay, doesn't qualify, you're saying nay. Right. Okay, or you can just you can say, give me some Tracy. That's crazy. All right, Shane Beamer. He would have to make 
the college football playoff after beating Tennessee and Clemson in November, that would define breakout to me because he's already kind of broken out as an above average to good coach, but he's not great. Can he have a breakout season as a great coach this year? He could, but he won't. I think he, I, I think he had a breakout month. He had a breakout November and that's going to be the highest moment of his life as a coach, not of his life, but as of his coaching life. Of his life. <laughs> Forget about having kids and stuff and getting married. Uh, South Carolina fans say, why don't you shut the hell up? All right, so uh, Eli Drinkwitz, can he be a breakout player? That's crazy. You mean breakout coach. Breakout coach. Look, you know. Oh, come on, Caleb. No, I don't think he's that good of a coach, but I – look, Missouri was really close in a lot of games last year. The SEC East is horrible. They return a lot of talent, and I'm looking at their schedule. South Dakota, Middle Tennessee, Kansas State's at home, Memphis – yeah, I don't you know think what? the East is horrible anymore. I think Tennessee's really good. We know Georgia's good. I think that Kentucky forced Will Levis to play at times for whatever reason when he was hurt. I think they'll be better. And I think Florida will be better if they find a quarterback. I don't think the East is as bad as you. I think Missouri's beating Florida at home this year. Interesting. Okay. So then, that yeah, was, break out. So Drinkwitz was uh, third down. And uh, by the way, um, People at SEC Media Days, what did you have to say about Eli last year when he went on the Jim Rome show and blasted Tennessee for no reason? You suck. Oh, um, right. What about Hugh Freeze? That's my no. guy. Hugh Freeze, breakout player. Hey now. Breakout coach, you mean? Coach. No, because there's no way he's going to outdo hey his best season at Ole Miss this year. He's not. Like, he may do that in a couple of years, but he's not going to do it this year. So you the only you the only breaking out Hugh Freeze will do will he might have breakouts on his face out of the stress of trying to keep his women secret. Okay. Does I wonder if he looks at escorts the same way as players with the small ankles thing? Because he looks at all <laughs> players with small ankles. Do you determine the potential of an escort based off their ankle size? That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, I can't answer I, that, but I'm gonna guess yes. I'm, oh my god i'm going back you to family I mean, guy you don't, you don't want like a best escort with a big huge ankles do you that's a i'm going line. back to i'm going back to family guy one time and they made this joke of bill clinton was in town because he was judging a cankles contest <laughs> oh wow <laughs> travis does judge women by their ankles i my best friend in high school his dad did that too Okay, I'm, I'm not going with the big ankles, but I don't know that there's a difference between average ankles and small ankles. So, there's a difference in my eyesight, and it's because of Campbell Cunningham, Taylor, and Han. Not, not wearing glasses or contacts anymore. They took care of my lace. It can also do your cataract procedure. It is uh, absolutely fantastic. And they're local. Campbell Cunningham, Taylor, and Han. Give me some other guys out there that could be breakout coaches in the 2023 season and then i'll let tracy morgan and hank kingsley give you my take on whether or not they could be breakout coaches are you ready are you ready to not have your head explode yes jacob what should we do what's up everybody this is jacob warren asking you to like subscribe and share dave needs this all right let's go i'm ready i'm your huckleberry <laughs> What do you got? Clark, Give me a coach. Clark Lee. Clark Lee at Vanderbilt. I'm seeing That's six Clark wins this. I'm seeing six wins this year. That's not you can't break out of Vanderbilt. So you and I have different definitions. So I won't argue with you on that, but I just don't think you can have you can if you win six games at Vanderbilt, you should be hired for a job anywhere because that's like one of the James, hardest things to do. James Franklin did that, and I think he beat my high school as one of the wins. It, it got, got him the stay. job at Penn State. Okay. Okay, uh, Travis says you're high. All, All right, right. Vanderbilt's going to start 4-0, guys. They're going to start the season 4-0. They're beating Wake Forest this year. At, yeah, you, at just, Wake Forest. you can't be a breakout guy, Vanderbilt. You can just go get another job. I mean, breakout's like, holy gravy, this guy's incredible. You're beating a bunch of punks. People were saying that about school. James Franklin at the time, even though they were wrong, because they were like, holy, this guy finished in the top 25 at Vanderbilt. I still say that about him. Yes, but national media was all about him. I mean, he's gone to Penn State and done nothing. All right, Caleb. Who else? 
Um, okay, so let's let's move out of the SEC for a minute. A, a guy that no one's really talking about, who under the radar did a really good job last year at Texas Tech. Joey McGuire went eight and five, and I think I, I would know Joey McGuire if he delivered my UPS parcels tomorrow. So he installed the Bryles yeah. offense at Texas Tech, and watch out. This okay. is the second year. I'm going to give you a hey now because I don't know. Hey now. All right. Who else you got? So another one that – would you say this is a breakout or would you say he already broke out, which was Mike Elko at Duke went 9-4 and four last year. No one's really talking about that, but did go 9-4. and four. Well, he has to – in order to get to be a breakout by our standards, he would have to make he's the gotta go. He's yeah. got to go like 11-2. and two. Yeah. Or something That's like crazy. that. Don't you don't think Duke can go eleven and two? No. Who else you got? <laughs> uh, okay, and then um, a possible breakout, but he ha- he'd have to win the Pac-12 and make the college football playoff. Could be Dan Lanning at Oregon. Um, hey now, I like that one because I think his schedule is easy too. So could he slip into the college football playoff? Certainly. Give me some more names. All right, and another one. Washington State, Jake Dickert. Last year was his first year as full-time head coach. For those who don't remember, he was thrust into the job because a previous <laughs> coach wouldn't get vaccinated. Some things like that. He went seven and six last year. What what was his name again? His last name? <laughs> I don't want to say. Jake Dickert. Hey now. <laughs> okay. Travis says Caleb scraping the bottom of the barrel. I tend to agree. Good luck. Wait, 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 wait. Dickert. You I know? didn't I didn't. I did not say Brent Pry. I'm not screaming the bottle of the barrel. That I didn't say Mario Cristobal, who still I think was the worst hire last year in football. I don't know what how Mario Cristobal keeps getting jobs. Tom I want his agent. On, you guys are cracking me up lately on the message board. Tom said, "We know who's not having a breakout year. Mike Gundy at Oklahoma State. <laughs> he has just been there, toiling along forever, not winning championships." Keeping his job, flirting with hasn't others. He maxed out what's pop- hasn't he maxed out what's possible there, though? <laughs> He's like he got an NBA Supermax contract. Um, yeah, I mean, He's got a, his really weird career. It would be like if you chose to write a book about somebody, he would be the last because it would be so boring. You've got the 40 thing. You've got the mullet. What else you got? The dancing in the locker room. You got the crazy loss to Iowa State. Hey, oh, he, he was part of the game that literally changed college football. For those of you who don't know, the college football playoff came into play because Alabama got to have a rematch with LSU in 2011. The only reason they got that rematch was because Oklahoma State blew a 24-7 to lead to Iowa State on a random Friday night. Oklahoma State wins that game. They go play LSU for the national title. They get destroyed, and the BCS still exists. I think losing to Iowa State was the best thing that could have ever happened to Oklahoma State because they get to complain about not playing for the national title when they would have gotten clobbered had they played for it. What was that coach's name again? Mike Gundy? No, for that. (laughs) Jake Dickert? All right. Have a fantastic day, everyone. He's Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker. We're live each and every weekday at 10 a.m. off the hook sports.com for your best recruiting coverage and more. Have a fantastic morning, night, evening, day, whatever it might be, everyone. For Caleb, I'm Dave. Off.